So good evening, everybody, at least here. Um, for those of you who attend uh, this webinar from Germany, my name is Volker Brühl. I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Financial Studies at Goethe University. And um, well, I'd like to welcome Mitch Steves, who gives a presentation today um, on cryptocurrencies, especially focusing on the future um, perspectives. Mitch is um, a equity research analyst and a director in the capital markets division of the Royal Bank of Canada. And um, he's focusing for quite some time on the technology sector and also following closely the uh, interesting developments in the cryptocurrency sector. So um, we are very glad to have uh, Mitch here for this presentation. So thanks for joining us. And uh, well, I hand over to Mitch. Uh, and Mitch, uh, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, Mitch Steves, a semiconductor semicap uh, analyst at RBC. Um, in case there's any issues with the webinar stuff, here's my email at the front page if you have questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so, so basically, I, I started writing about this space a little bit more uh, back when we started covering NVIDIA and AMD more closely as it related to cryptocurrency, and it ended up being a pretty significant um, revenue driver. So I'll kind of go over really quick what happened to the semiconductor space and how that related uh, to cryptocurrency. So way back from the initiation of Bitcoin back in 2009, people were using CPUs, central processing units, to uh, use their computers to mine or secure the Bitcoin network. Then eventually a bunch of people started realizing that using GPUs is more um, efficient. Then we eventually created FPGAs. And now you've got very large private companies like Bitmain um, and many other types of chip companies making specialized ASICs um, to secure the network. Um, this is still going on today, um, not on the Bitcoin network as the Bitcoin network is run by ASICs, but the GPU network um, for other crypto assets such as Ethereum um, are still profitable today. Um, so yes, despite all the volatility we've seen in the market, um, you can still make money uh, mining cryptocurrencies at your own home or more likely with a sophisticated data center. So here's a quick snapshot of kind of the, um, the, the ROIs you're gonna get, um, revenue or profit per day over a three day, five day, seven day period. Um, again, this is not a significant driver of revenue for AMD and NVIDIA, but it used to be. Um, and on slide five here, you can see um, that it generated well over a billion dollars of revenue for these companies. So back then, people only focused on Bitcoin. They had no idea um, what Ethereum was, which is a new smart contract platform, uh, which I'll explain later. But the long story short is this generated billions of dollars of revenue um, for both AMD and NVIDIA. And for those that are really interested in the, if this industry will come back in a more meaningful manner, manner uh, the answer is yes at this point, uh, because right now it's unclear if Ethereum will fork and go to a proof of stake mechanism by December or not. If it does not, um, and, the, and the DAG file reaches four gigabytes or so, that would be require GPUs to be used again um, at that time. So again, that's December of 2020, where you'd expect there to be a substantial shift in demand for NVIDIA and AMD products. Again, that's as of the current technologically, uh, technolo technology timeframes that they've laid out. Um, so that's a quick backdrop uh, on why we're, we're talking about this and, and how, how it's impacted our space in the past. So now here's on to the, we're gonna move on to the fun part of the presentation. So what is cryptocurrency and uh, how I can put some disclaimers around this. So first of all, I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, there's gonna be a small portion of you who are gonna end up like me. You're gonna lose a lot of sleep. You're gonna think about this all day. Uh, your girlfriend, your wife, your boyfriend, your husband's going to tell you, stop talking about this stuff to me. You're talking about it too much and you become obsessed with it. That's going to be some of you. Um, a large chunk of you are going to think that I'm absolutely crazy and I have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's perfectly fine as well. Um, for those that, that know my stock recommendation history, I'm very interested in kind of high volatility, big debate um, stocks like AMD, NVIDIA, and several of these other um, higher end high tech technology companies. And then finally, uh, there's going to be another subset of people who just are not interested at all. So again, this is not here. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm just here to kind of explain how stuff works and you can decide what this means for you um, and if it's interesting to you. Um, I'm going to make one big parallel here, which is to the internet. So the internet is something we all use every day. And I'm sure some of the people listening to this can't explain it, but I really doubt that the average person walking down the street can tell you how TCP IP works, how NSP backbone works, how a router and a switch work, 
how Tomahawk Jericho products all, all fit into this entire ecosystem. So my point there isn't to say that we know a lot about tech. My point is that you don't really need to know um, how everything works in order for it to be valuable to you. And so if you want to go back in time, you can go back and see this uh, presentation from Bill Gates on the future of internet in 1997. And uh, he fails to really even predict what's going to happen to the internet. All he says is it's a trillion dollar question and uh, there's going to be a lot more competition in the future because you can start a business by utilizing a server. So again, that's kind of a little bit defensive for me because there's just no way uh, for anybody to tell you exactly how things are going to work out uh, 10 or 20 years ago. So, or sorry, 10 or 20 years in the future. So I would um, just keep that in mind. Um, and then the second one I would like to disclaim is that basically uh, there's five different ways to gain cryptocurrencies or acquire them if you're interested. Uh, one is through like a local Bitcoins or peer-to-peer -peer network. Second is through exchanges. Third is through ATMs. Uh, fourth is through a, a Bitcoin trust. It's just such a grayscale. Um, uh, full disclosure, I do own some grayscale products in my own personal account. And then finally, you can also buy or sell services uh, for crypto assets. So just putting all that up front, and now we can jump into the presentation into why I think using the internet is a very good example of how to explain this industry. So if you think about the internet, it did a ton of things for us. So, the, but the main one I want to focus on here is it doesn't matter where you are right now. You could be in Germany, you could be in the United States, Canada, Colombia, Mexico. We're all kind of in the same room. It's a virtual room on Zoom, uh, but basically we're able to communicate for cheap. Uh, back in the day, you used to go into, into a pay phone and pay dollars and dollars just to call somebody in Japan or, or Korea or Canada. It didn't matter. And companies were making tons of money because there's no way to actually connect with one another. But now with a computer or a cell phone, I'm not even sure, you can actually be using a cell phone now. Um, you can watch this whole thing from anywhere around the world. So that's the focus part of the internet of what it did uh, for us and, what, and how it's gonna relate uh, to cryptocurrencies. So on slide eight, uh, I would like to really emphasize how much has changed over the last 10, 20 years or so. So 10 years ago, let's go back to 1997, so it'd be about 20 years ago, you fast forward about a decade and the iPhone came out. And what did the iPhone do? It, do? it took all the items on the outside of this picture here and it consolidated all into one object. Um, so no, you don't really see payphones anymore. There's no such thing as really cameras anymore. Uh, Blockbuster doesn't exist. Um, CNN's basically being displaced by Twitter and Facebook and social media. DVD players, I haven't seen one of those in years. Uh, physical maps, I haven't seen anybody pull one of those out in a long time. So my point here is that all this stuff really got consolidated into one item in the palm of your hands because you had the internet there. And that's what created uh, Apple's smartphone ecosystem, which ended up being a trillion dollar company. It's actually worth uh, two trillion now, uh, but you get the idea, all this value essentially consolidated into one asset, into one uh, mechanism. So I would just keep this slide in mind. Uh, we're gonna refer back to this. We're also gonna refer back to this world room example um, several times. So again, just remember that all this stuff consolidated into one item. So now, now, why am I using the internet again as an example? So let's think about what happened. When the internet came out, we were able to basically communicate for free. What, ended, what everybody ended up doing is they ended up sharing all their files for free. So as soon as, let's say, uh, the ne next hit song from any artist or rapper, it doesn't matter, came out, people would load it up onto their server. That server would then be shared with other people as they sent it via email or uploads and downloads, et cetera, et cetera. And so the value of that digital product went down substantially. Um, I'm saying this because there's a very specific reason why I'm using the music industry, and it's because of something called BitTorrent. So everybody knows that you're able to send and receive information for free, or practically for free now with, e with email. And the question is, why weren't they able to stop this? And that's like the, the, the real point of why I'm using BitTorrent and the internet as an example here. Back in the day, you used to have cassette players and CD players that would jump around, and these were physical devices that you held in your hand. And the music industry was making more and more money because they were able to sell um, these products for higher amounts of dollars because it became more valuable. Instead of rewinding and fast forwarding through songs, you were basically skipping around. But then what happened? Suddenly, somebody created something called BitTorrent, which allowed you to load all your files instantly to the internet and nobody would know which server it was on. And so by the time it was on one server, it was then replicated on hundreds of other servers, which then spread around the globe. And then suddenly everybody had access to the same song. So what did this do to the music industry? Basically it disintermediated the entire business model. And um, now if you fast forward to today, really the music industry is more of a, a services industry, as you can see with Spotify being kind of your real example of what the music industry uh, looks like today. So why am I referring to BitTorrent? 
uh, because that's the mechanism they use to, to distribute all the information. And now you get an understanding of why it's called Bitcoin. It's because what you're doing is you're using the exact same technology where you're loading up on several servers, dis uh, uh, I guess, decentralized across the, the world. And so that is the reason why you can't really figure out where all the data is going, right? But the problem with the with Bit, uh, BitTorrent was that there's no control of the information. And so what was created was a, a decentralized ledger technology. So again, I'm going to try to use avoid using uh, uh, technical jargon, but so instead I'm going to return back to a world room example. So we already know that we're all in the same room right now, and we want to create a way to make a form of money or payment. What we do is we create a ledger for everybody. So this is the exact same concept as before. So instead of us loading up all these songs for free, instead now we all have to show every single transaction we do. This makes it impossible to fake because if I send one transaction to you, uh, one of the listeners, everybody listening to this has to see the transaction, you update your ledger, and so now you know I, I, get, I got rid of one Bitcoin and gave it to somebody else. And now this is loaded up on millions of servers at the same time. So in order for you to uh, invalidate the data or make an erroneous transaction, you have to trick a millions and millions of people on the same network. So now that is not really feasible because it's not really possible to hack a million computers at the same time. So that is the layman's example of how Bitcoin works. We're all in this virtual room together, but in order for any transaction to be done, everybody must see it, everybody must sign off, it, uh, off on it, and everybody must agree. So this makes it impossible to fake a single ledger because everybody has a copy of the exact same ledger. So the layman's way to explain this is imagine trying to hack every single computer in the world at the same time, not really feasible. So with that backdrop around on what, a, uh, on what Bitcoin did and what it is, I'm gonna go ahead and define a cryptocurrency. There's no real um, layman's example of what a cryptocurrency is. So I'm really gonna give you three uh, definitions from RBC's perspective of what a cryptocurrency is uh, versus a digital asset. So a cryptocurrency has to have three features. Number one, it has to be open to everybody. The second one is it has to be permissionless and the third one has to be decentralized. So the first one's really easy to understand, which is that you have to be able to access it no matter where you are in the world. The second one is that it has to be permissionless, which means nobody is allowed to stop the transaction. If I want to send you a Bitcoin right now, nobody can get in the middle of that and say, I, I don't want this transaction to go through. The third one is decentralized. That's a little bit tougher to explain without using these sort of technical functions. So the way I would describe it is, if you have the software base or software code, which is really what this all is, run by one person, that would be centralized for sure because only one person controls the code. If you had 10 people, that's still pretty centralized because you can all collude to work on it. Now, if you had a million people all working on it, I would, I would argue that's very decentralized because it's very difficult to collude with a million people at the same time. So that would be the definition of decentralized. Just imagine a bunch of people, different, a bunch of people um, all around the world scattered working on the same software base. That would be a decentralized system. So for those that are still confused on this, I've got one extra um, example to compare it to Libra. I would argue that Libra is a digital currency. It's not a cryptocurrency because it fails the first definition. So if you don't have Facebook and you don't have access to Facebook um, or they want to shut you down, you can't open a Libra wallet anyway. So that fails property number one. Property number two is permissionless. Libra cannot be permissionless because Facebook or the consortium should be allowed to shut you down at any time. If you wanted to send a Libra token from me to you, Facebook or Zuckerberg can go in there and stop the transaction. So it fails that, that second definition. Third definition it fails is central control. Well, if Facebook's able to control this, clearly um, it's not decentralized. It would be a centralized cryptocurrency, sorry, a centralized crypto asset. So I call it a digital currency and not a cryptocurrency. Um, so that is the definition for this. Now we've got an understanding of Bitcoin. We've got an understanding of what Libra is versus Bitcoin and what a cryptocurrency is. And so now we can really start thinking very high level of what this means for you. This is probably the part um, where I'm going to start sounding a little bit crazier to a lot of people. People are going to get really interested into this or they're just going to lose interest entirely because this is really where the crux of the majority of the debates are around this growing asset class. So number one, what is money? Money has to be something that is of value in the future. That's the simplest way to explain it, and it has to be accepted by a lot of people. 
So the example I give to you is if you're in Europe, United States or Canada, and you have, let's say $10 or 10 euros in your pocket, and you know that can buy you a case of, let's say Coca-Cola. Very simple example. Well, if you thought that you could only buy one can of Coca-Cola tomorrow, well, that money wouldn't be worth very much because what you would do is you'd immediately spend it, right? If I knew that I could buy 10 cans of Coke today, uh, or I can buy one tomorrow only, I'm gonna spend everything I can right now. I'm gonna consolidate that, get as, many, get as many cans of Coke as I can, and I'm just gonna get rid of the money. So one of the main items is it has to be worth something in the future. And so that's why I think it's really interesting to look at uh, the what's called the HODL wave or how long people have been holding their Bitcoins in their wallets. So if you look at it over the last decade or so, we moved from about 25 to 30% of Bitcoins had not been moved in a year. So that means that because we see every single transaction, we know that 25% of all Bitcoins have been sitting in one address and have not moved. That has accelerated, as you can see in the yellow line, all the way up uh, to 63%, which is an all-time high. So what that means is all, all the Bitcoins that are out there now, 63% of them have not moved in a full year. So I would argue, or some would argue, that this is, um, that this is a pretty significant uh, change because what you're seeing is a move from 25% uh, to 63%. And so people are really holding on to their, their crypto assets for the long term. Um, the second item is that not only does, does money have to be uh, seen to hold value, I would argue that it needs to be seen as scarce as well. So if you print trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, that usually devalues the currency or the asset. And that's going to be uh, covered a little bit later here. But if you look at that as the value proposition, scarcity being part of the value proposition, this is why Bitcoin is compared to what's called digital gold, uh, because it compared to the asset of gold. Gold has about 190,000 uh, uh, tons above ground right now, and about 3,000 tons are pulled out of the earth every single year. So if we take that 190 and you divide it by 3,000, you're going to get a stock to flow or a scarcity ratio of about 60. Now, if you do that for silver, you get a ratio of about 22 to 23. Um, and if you plot that on a line on the right, you can see that the value of the uh, of commodities, silver, gold, palladium, et cetera, generally fall, follow that trend line of if you're more scarce, you're more valuable. I'm bringing this up because Bitcoin right now has a stock to flow ratio of about 56. Um, that's pretty similar to gold, it's a little bit less, but I would argue that it's similar. And then in 2025, that's gonna jump to about 121. And then after that, it's going to jump to 400 plus um, after the next halving after that in 2029. Uh, but it's important to really think about this because this Bitcoin, Bitcoin is effectively the first finite asset we have. I realize it's going to sound a little bit crazy, but if you look at uh, Elon Musk and you look at all the space development we're seeing, you don't really know how much gold is out there. So if you spend more money, you can actually pull more gold out of the ground but there's a finite number of Bitcoins. So there's more gold in, in, in the ground. There's more gold on asteroids and things like that all over the place that we may be able to get access to in the future. So it's a scarce asset. It's not really a finite asset. And so to wrap up this idea of digital gold and kind of Bitcoin, how it works, you can see in the top right there, Bitcoin has got a market value of about 170, 180 billion. I'm not sure where the price is today. I think around $10,000 to $12,000, something like that. And that gets you to that rough market cap range of 172. That compares to gold, which has a market cap of 11 trillion. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how uh, disparate the value is despite having a similar scarcity ratio. And if you look at the price of Bitcoin here in the center of the chart, you can see that it has effectively tracked the scarcity value. So before it used to hover around $1,000, then it started hovering around $10,000 uh, now. And if this continues to follow the model or the quantitative model, again, this is not investment advice, but the quantitative model would suggest that you're gonna get to around $100,000 per Bitcoin. Assuming again, that it follows the same stock to flow uh, ratio that it has in the past. And so that's why you see a lot of people who debate uh, very high valuations around, around the asset. Some people view, view it as being worth nothing. Um, and again, I'll, it's not investment advice. So I'll allow you to kind of make your own decisions um, on what you think it's going to be worth um, in the future. The second problem that Bitcoin solves. So the other one is interesting because I can again relate to this conversation right here. Um, if you're in Germany and I want to send you $100, that's probably going to cost me 10 bucks. 
Uh, that's just the reality of the situation because either A, I have to use a MoneyGram, a Western Union, a Zoom, a Remitly, or I have to use an a international wire transfer. No matter what I'm doing, I'm gonna have to pay a fee there. And uh, maybe some of you don't, have never really sent money abroad, but um, if you have, you'll realize that there's a three to 5% fee associated with that. And there's about 500 to $600 billion um, that is sent uh, around, the, around, the, around the world um, uh, pretty much every year. Um, hold on one second, I got a bunch of questions. So, um, okay, never mind. these are just for later. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, please, please keep the questions to the end. I will read them, but um, just let me finish the, the, the overview. Some of these questions will be answered. Um, so 500, 600 billion a year, so imagine 5% of that. That's another market opportunity that Bitcoin or a crypto, crypto asset could, um, could help with because it would be effectively be for free. So instead of it costing 10 bucks for me to send you $100, I can currently send you about 900, uh, sorry, $99.99 uh, for basically a penny if I would just pay the miners to send the uh, transaction over to you. Now let's go to the big picture. The really big picture here, if you paid, uh, pay no attention to anything else I've said, this is the biggest picture you're gonna get. Centralization is a security flaw. That is just a fact and it's not debatable. If I get access or somebody gets access to Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, Apple servers, they get access to all of your information. Equifax, Twitter, Target have all been hacked. We all saw what happened earlier this year with Twitter. So this is a significant issue because if I get access to any centralized entity, I can then steal all the information. This is um, something that happens all the time. And I hate to say it, but the bad guys sometimes win. So we don't even know how many people have already stolen information and actually got away with it because you can hack a system and not actually um, announce that you've hacked it and just take the information and run. So sometimes the bad guys really do win. So centralization is a security flaw. And what is the most centralized asset in the world? Money. Money is actually the most centralized asset in the world because it's controlled by definition, a central bank, right? And so if this sounds uh, nutty or kooky to you, um, I would say you should probably go visit Argentina, uh, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, uh, Turkey is having a lot of issues now. And you can see several examples where central, central planning, it goes wrong. You saw in February 2009, uh, Zimbabwe printed a $100 trillion note due to rampant inflation. Over the last five years alone, uh, we've seen the US dollar go from one US dollars equals eight Argentinian pesos to now about 77. Um, that's a pretty significant devaluation of 10 times. And then you're looking at Lebanon, which is hovering around low to mid single digit um, inflation. And now they're seeing 56% inflation per month. So these are very serious issues. I would say that if you believe that it doesn't pertain to you, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can believe in, in, and have faith in your currency. Maybe you live in Europe or the US and you have very little uh, worries when, as, as it relates to currency control. But just think about what this means for other people who may not believe um, in the currency that they're using. Again, you can use Venezuela as another example, but this has happened several times in the past. So that is the big picture on Bitcoin. Now I'm gonna start going a little bit sci-fi for the people who are a little bit nerdier and have no life like me and enjoy reading about this stuff all the time. So if you look at what you can do, if you already know that you can create a digital money, this does not stop you from creating a digital contract. So I'm gonna use gambling as an example here. I was told that's a bad example, but I can't really think of an easier one. So basically you and me, uh, the other person, the other line will be betting on the New York Yankees. So you're gonna be the stick figure in the bottom left, left. I'll be the Boston Red Sox. I'm gonna bet on them winning the game. The game is over, uh, the New York uh, Yankees win. So I owe you uh, one crypto asset, let's call it. So what happens is everybody sees every single contract that we've ever signed. So go back to the same example of Bitcoin where we see every transaction. And in this case, you're gonna see every single contract. So everybody saw me make this bet and everybody saw you guys agree to this bet. So now I have to send you the asset automatically uh, using something called Ethereum. And now you're gonna obtain a crypto asset. So this cannot be cheated on again because every single transaction or contract is signed off on. Every single transaction win or lose is then updated on the ledger and you cannot fake it because it's again uploaded to millions of transactions at the same time, sorry, millions of computers at the same time. So now, if this sounds confusing, I can give it to you in a, in a very simple bulleted form here, uh, which is in the top right. So typically the way this is done is that instead of us making a contract like that peer to peer, 
you would have to go through a bookie, right? You'd have to go to Vegas or something like that. And then the bookie takes a cut by either charging a fee or be creating a spread between the winners and losers of about 10 points for the VIG. Um, and so right now you basically have a party, a contract sign that goes through a third party, then they execute the contract. In the new environment, the way that this works is you and me sign the digital contract that is then loaded to the blockchain. The blockchain then waits and scrapes all the information from MSN Sports, Yahoo Sports, Fox Sports, ESPN Sports. Once it agrees that the, the Yankees have won, your money is automatically sent to the person on the left. So this is pretty significant because what you've done is you've disintermediated all, tra all transactions that are contract-based. You no longer need physical contracts. All you really need um, is a person with access to the internet who can sign off on all these digital contracts. So now that we understand the gambling example in, in pretty layman's terms here, you can think about what, what else in the world is contracts? Well, that's pretty much uh, a multi-trillion dollar uh, market opportunity because you can have the following ideas. You can have loans, you can have houses, you can have computing, uh, computing that you lend out to your friends. You can have uh, digital art. If I can make digital money scarce, I can now make digital pictures and movies scarce and only available to certain people. Uh, there is a wide, wide range of, uh, of opportunities here. So I'm gonna give you one that's not theoretical and that's going on today. Um, so one is actually the digital loan environment. So let's say you own a Bitcoin and you don't wanna get rid of it. You wanna keep it, but you need some money. Um, what you do is you put that into a decentralized smart contract and you say, I'm gonna loan you my Bitcoin. You can hold on to my Bitcoin, which is worth, let's say 10, 10 grand, but you're gonna give me a thousand US dollars and I'm gonna go use that and I'll pay you back. And when I pay you back, with an interest rate of four or five percent, you then give me back my Bitcoin. Why would you do this? Well, you would do this because um, you don't want to sell your Bitcoin. You think it's going to go up in price, for example. And then the person giving the loan wants to do this because he wants to make interest um, on his money. So this is a real industry. And on the right side of the chart here, or on the, on the slide here, you can see there's about six to seven billion dollars in locked value. Um, I think the latest I checked here on my smartphone, um, it's about seven billion dollars. So $7 billion is locked up on these types of financial contracts um, up from about 500 million just a year and a half ago. So it's growing pretty rapidly and it has clear value because you're able to loan money um, to one another without any sort of um, third party risk because you would get instantly liquidated at the value of the, of the Bitcoin dropped below a certain level. So let's walk through how that would work in terms of a basic loan. So again, I'm gonna use the same example. You wanna put up your crypto asset, let's say $300 worth, and then you're gonna get $100 back in return to use for your own, uh, for whatever, for your day-to-day -day uses. If you do not pay this money back, you're automatically liquidated and your crypto asset, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum, is immediately sent to the person who gave you the loan. Now, if you do pay the loan back and you do pay the 100 or $200 that you owe back, then you immediately get back your Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. So as you can see, this is based on a collateralized loan. Um, again, I don't like using uh, nomenclature, or sorry, complex financial terms. So basically, you're guaranteeing them the asset that you gave them unless you pay them back. After you pay them back, they, you then take your asset back. So this is, a, this is very similar to any sort of structured loan where you're putting an asset up um, as collateral. So that's pretty much how it works. You're getting loans on crypto assets currently. And again, that's a $7 billion uh, market already today. Now, this is the last slide of complexity. So um, this is where I really, get, I'm gonna go even more sci-fi here. And there's really three big ones that are going on. Number one is synthetics. Synthetics is a pretty interesting property. Basically what it's doing is they're creating synthetic crypto assets that mirror the price movement of any asset in the world. Now, this is pretty crazy because basically you can now mirror the price of gold, the price of silver, uh, the price of a single stock, be it AMD or Tesla. And you can now access that anywhere around the world. So again, I think a lot of us take our own financial situation for granted. So if you're in Africa and you wanted to buy Tesla or AMD stock, um, how would you do that? The answer is you really wouldn't be able to. It's very difficult. So now if you have a synthetic crypto asset that mirrors the price movement of the stock, you now have access to invest in any asset around the world um, with a click of a button on your computer screen. That is significant and hopefully people understand why that would change uh, the pricing and potentially the uh, efficiency of financial markets um, long-term. 
Second one, second application is insurance. Insurance is probably one of the most cost heavy industries in the world. 50% of its entire cost base is actually operations and information technology. So <clears throat> in a low interest rate environment, how is an insurance agency supposed to make money in that environment? Very difficult. So you could think of a basic auto loan um, or insurance on a, auto, uh, on a car. If you were making payments on an auto loan and you suddenly didn't pay, what they could do is they could link this to a blockchain contract. As soon as you don't pay, your car engine immediately gets shut down. This would be a little bit more sci-fi again, but this is where we're going with tech. Basically, everything's be more electric, electronic. So if you missed your car payment, the company could then lock you down and repossess your car very quickly. That's a great thing for insurance companies. Um, I guess not as, not, as, not as good for the bad guys who don't want to make their payments, uh, but basically you're able to now lock down instantly a car um, if they don't make payments and you're able to efficientize the entire uh, loan contract for cars and insurance payments as well. The final one, number three, this is really for the people who are really deep in the weeds on this stuff. This is a big, big change in the industry, which is now yield. It's called yield farming or yield chasing. Again, I'm gonna dumb this down to basic terms. I'm not gonna give you the complex step-by-step uh, uh, -step where you collateralize a wrapped Bitcoin, put it into compound, put it on the balancer and chase yields. It's just too much. So basically think about it like this. If we know that I can now get loans based on putting Bitcoin or Ethereum up into a smart contract, well, that means I can also provide different interest rates based on what I'm loaning out. So let's say I wanna, I wanna get a loan against Bitcoin. My uh, interest rate is probably gonna differ if it's Bitcoin or if it's Ethereum or if it's a synthetic uh, version of Tesla stock or AMD stock or gold or what have you. And so what people are doing now is they're taking loans out against certain assets. They're going and finding a different asset that gets a better return and they're trying to create spreads. So <clears throat> I've really, really simplified it. The reality is that people are putting their items onto compound and then they're trying to find ways to get more yields by going to different pools of money. But for the, for the simplest um, explanation, people are chasing yields based on the returns of their crypto assets. So if you understood that part, you're really gonna probably start losing sleep at night because you're gonna understand what's gonna happen technologically to hundreds of industries over the next several years if this works. Um, so with that said, I've kind of painted a very bullish picture, a positive picture of crypto. So to make sure I'm balanced here because I'm not here to convince anybody of anything, I kind of gave up on that, on convincing people back in 2013. So I'm gonna talk about some of the downsides. Downside number one, since you are responsible for your own assets, if you lose your keys, you are done. You lose it forever. There is no Bitcoin CEO. There's no Ethereum CEO. There's no Ethereum server. There's no, there's not even an Ethereum office, right? So as soon as you lose your keys, if you throw them away in the top right, you are done. You lose everything. There is no coming back from this. Um, so that is a downside. The second one is that it's much harder to scale. One of the good things about centralized software code like iOS or uh, Microsoft is you all work for the same company. You all agree on what's going to happen. You all agree on when to update it. And um, all of that works for you uh, very seamlessly. If you do that in a decentralized environment with millions of people scattered around the world, not as easy to update, right? So that's a negative. Um, another one, um, I didn't mention this in the slide, but one that's obvious, you need more adoption. If people don't use it, it, it has no value, of course. So you need adoption to increase. And then finally, another big one is uh, privacy. If I find out what your Bitcoin or Ethereum address is, I can now track every single one of your transactions. So that's why it's pretty much laughable that people believe Bitcoin is used for any sort of criminal activity because that's pretty much the absolute worst asset you could use because they could trace every single transaction you've ever made going back to your very first one. So they're eventually gonna catch you. And that's pretty much what has happened to every single person who's tried to um, use it as for criminal activity over the last um, several years. So let's go ahead and address some of those concerns, some of those negative items, uh, starting with responsibility. So in no particular order here, again, um, here are several different types of funds you can invest in if you're not interested in managing your own crypto assets. Um, you've got coin fund in here, you've got kinetic capital, you've got the token fund. I mean, I, there's just a ton of them in here. These are basically crypto or venture focused uh, 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 funds that focus entirely on this sector. Another, uh, a, another responsibility solution, Binance, Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken. These are all exchanges you can go through to get crypto assets. Um, another one that's coming up is banks are now allowed to offer cryptocurrency custody solutions according to regulators. So that's another one that may be coming up. 
In the bottom left, you've got a crypto trust um, where you can own it in your own Fidelity or trading account. Sorry, it doesn't necessarily need to be Fidelity. Vanguard or whoever, you can own it in a stock account. And then finally, number four, uh, for the more hardcore people, you can ignore all this stuff, put it all on, put the responsibility onto yourself, own it on a hardware wallet, a software wallet on a smartphone, a desktop wallet or a paper wallet. So these are all different in the uh, very various types of responsibility solutions. The big difference is if you're not in the bottom right there, you're trusting somebody else to hold your assets. If you're in the bottom right, you're trusting yourself. And if you lose your coins, you're gonna lose everything. So the second item I talked about is addressing adoption. So you need more people to use this. And I think this slide is really interesting because you can see people who are on the older generation side, call it 55 plus, they really don't believe Bitcoin's an interesting financial technology. Um, they don't think that it's that uh, innovative for the future. But if you go on the left side, you can see the, the younger generation, 18 to 34, that uh, more than 50% of them believe it's a positive innovation for financial technology. And that seems to be increasing. I think this is pretty important to think about because you want to think about the flow of money. I think a lot of people get confused when they think about asset prices as they, as they believe that, you know, stocks or bonds or something's up or down, but it's really just about what are your other options? What else are you going to invest in? Who's moving money around in the world? So on this slide, we can see that about 60% of the entire U.S. household wealth is owned by the baby boomer generation. Back when the millennials were about in the same age range in the mid thirties, they owned about 20% of the entire uh, uh, national household wealth. But now you can see that's in the mid single digits. So let's think about this. Let's think this through. Eventually the baby boomers have to transfer their assets to Gen X and millennials. Again, uh, I don't think a lot of them, are, I don't think everybody's gonna blow their money on Lambos and Ferraris in retirement, maybe they do. Uh, but uh, a large chunk of that's gonna go to the millennial generation. And so you can take an idea or maybe think about it for yourself. Will they, since 60% since of them uh, believe that it's a good technology innovation, will they buy crypto assets? So that's something for you to think about considering that the millennials only own about 5% of the household wealth while baby boomers are sitting at 60% and that generational wealth transfer has to happen at some point in time. Third one is another big one. Again, this is central bank digital currency, not cryptocurrency. It's digital by definition because it's a central bank digital currency. It's something that's being worked on today to kind of integrate the current financial system uh, with the new and growing decentralized financial system. And this is a quick snapshot of how it works. Um, I don't need to go into the details here. Just imagine central banks now trying to integrate into crypto assets going forward. The other one is privacy. Um, I left this slide just for the kind of the nerds that are watching this. On the right side, you can look at what ZK Snarks is. Really complicated stuff that I've really tried to put into layman's terms. But on the left side is something that uh, pretty much anybody can ex understand, even somebody walking down the street that doesn't know anything about crypto. Basically what this does is instead of saying one Bitcoin is sent from person A to person B, instead of person A to person B, we're gonna wait for 10 transactions to come through. So we're gonna wait for 10 Bitcoin transactions to come through. We're gonna put it into the center of a pile. We're gonna shake it up. And then the 10 transactions will go through with the correct 10 people all receive one Bitcoin. This is called a mixer or a, a, a transaction mixture, mixture because what you're doing now is you make it impossible to figure out who received what Bitcoins from who. So if I, person A was trying to send a person B, person B does receive one Bitcoin but he doesn't receive all the entire full one Bitcoin from person A. He receives it through a whole bunch of other random people who then send him an aggregate of one Bitcoin because we waited for the entire transaction uh, to clear with 10 or 10 plus people to go through. Again, that's just an example. You could use hundreds, uh, but you get the idea there. ZK Snarks is something that's used for um, um, <coughs> another way to prove you have information that you, you don't wanna share, uh, but I'm not gonna go through that one because I can probably leave that for the, for the Q&A. Um, so now, now I'm going to stop here and bring it all together. So I'm bringing us back to the very first um, internet example that I gave you. If you look on the outside, this looks pretty scary and people get freaked out whenever they see industries or businesses going to going away, no longer existing. But I'd like to pose a, a little bit more positive view of this. What really stopped Blockbuster from creating Netflix? Um, to my knowledge, the answer is pretty much nothing. Um, there's nothing that really stopped Blockbuster from creating Netflix? Did, is there anything that stopped CNN from creating Twitter? Again, that's a big no. Is there anything that actually stopped Toshiba from trying to create a smartphone? Again, the answer is no. 
So they actually knew that this stuff was coming. They just didn't do anything about it. So some of these industries went away. Some of them are still around, just in different form factors. We've got Venmo for cash. We've got Uber for cars. We've got um, uh, Google Translate that's replacing dictionaries, et cetera. And so uh, I, I would like to say that there's nothing really that not, there's nothing that really prevented people from actually going down and, and embracing new technology. The other thing I'd like to say from this slide is I remember way back when I was 13 or 14 years old, my mom used to tell me, um, whatever you do, uh, don't get in cars with strangers and whatever you do, um, do not um, uh, meet people from the internet. Well, now what we do every day is we order people from the internet to come pick us up at our houses and they're complete strangers using something called Uber. My point there isn't to generate really a lot of laughter. It's just to really kind of prove the point that um, what we believe in today and what we believe 10 to 15 years uh, from now can change pretty dramatically because you went from this is a definite no to this is a definite yes because it's a lot faster, more effective uh, way of transportation. So now what is this, how does this relate to cryptocurrency? Uh, that's the final slide here that I really want you guys to think about. If we know now that you can make contracts with anybody around the world in a secure way, what does this mean for all the industries on the outside? So instead of being consolidated into an app, sorry, I gotta go back here. Instead of all these items on the outside being consolidated into applications on the inside, we're gonna have all these industries on the outside here, consolidated dApps, decentralized applications, consolidated to the center here. So this could be nothing. It could be a technology that doesn't work. Um, it's slow and it's obviously it's still in beginning stages. It's only been around for five to 10 years or so, depending on which asset you look at. But my point here is that um, this could be very interesting because you can take every single industry that's contract-based and now you can put that in your pocket. Who knows if it's called a treasure, if it's on your smartphone, if it's on a certain type of different type of hardware device, I don't know. Um, all I do know is that this could be very disruptive um, to everything in the future. So let's go ahead and say that um, there's no chance this stuff works, for, but for fun, um, let's just say we're wrong. So I'm gonna turn this all back and ask ourselves, what if we're wrong? Um, what if we actually don't, um, what if we actually can scale the system and uh, this actually works? Well, I want you to take a step back. Let's bring it all together to what we're doing today. A hundred years ago, we had something called the Spanish flu, which killed millions of people. Um, the estimates are around between 30 and 50 million people. A hundred years later, we're now living in COVID-19. Um, if I told you in 2019 that I'd be doing this presentation from here and um, that I would be, I would never go to an office for the next six months, for the past six months, uh, that I would never get into a car for six months, that I wasn't driving myself, um, that I wouldn't be going to any bars or clubs or anything like that or any, any sort of social activity, I would have said you're absolutely crazy. And here we are uh, with rampant unemployment um, and significant increases in cases of COVID from something that hasn't happened in 100 years. So again, we knew this risk existed. We didn't do anything about it. And here we are. Um, another example that's even more real time that's still going on is we knew um, that the Argentinian peso could collapse. It, it's already collapsed in 2001. And now we're seeing significant devaluation of the currency going from seven to 88. And then in the bottom left here is really where I want people to start thinking more global and less uh, soloplistic and less about themselves and their own country. Um, if you look at Bitcoin's price or any crypto asset price, actually not any of them, but just use Bitcoin as an example, it's actually at an all time high in many countries, maybe not in your country, maybe not in the US, maybe not in Europe. I don't know where you are today, uh, but if your currency has been being devalued, you're actually up if you own Bitcoin. So back when Bitcoin uh, price spiked to 20,000 or so in 2017, it was worth about 400,000 Argentinian pesos. Today, it's worth about 800 to 900,000, depending on what the exchange rate is. So you have to really think about, is this, is this useful for me? Isn't the right answer? The answer is, is this useful to somebody? And is somebody gonna put more money into the ecosystem as a hedge? The final note is in the bottom right, um, I am not saying the U.S. dollar is going to collapse. That is not what I'm here to say. Um, that, again, will get people thinking that I'm crazy. Um, uh, instead, my point here is that reserve currencies change. Okay, so we know this for a fact. Portugal lasts about 80 years, Spain 110 years, Netherlands 80 years, France 95 years, Britain 105 years, maybe 115. And the U.S. dollar became the global reserve currency around 1920, 1935. I'm not going to split hairs on what the exact metric is but you can get the idea we're 85 to 100 years into global reserve currency. So 
if you are sitting in any country and you believe that your country has no chance of collapse, I would just ask you, what if you're wrong? What does that mean for you if you are dead wrong and your currency collapses? This is not something that we think about every single day, just as a year ago, we didn't think about global pandemics, COVID-19, um, walking around with face masks everywhere we go, not touching things. We never thought about this, right? But it happened and it's something that has happened every hundred years, um, every hundred years. So I would like to just say, even if you think there's a 1% chance or a 0.1% chance or 0.001% chance, what does it mean for you if you're wrong and your currency collapses and you do not own anything else that can be used as a form of transaction in the future? Again, this may not apply to Europe, it may not apply to the United States, but you can think about other countries where it would apply. And so um, I'm gonna kind of highlight the kind of the big three takeaways I wanna leave here. Luckily, I've done this pretty well on time at 45 minutes. So um, big three, a cryptocurrency is software code which needs to be um, accessible to anybody, needs to be able to be sent and received by anybody and shouldn't be stopped by anybody. So there is all this stuff about Libra coin, you can just ignore it. All this stuff about blockchain, not Bitcoin, blockchain, not cryptocurrency, makes no sense at all. Um, all this stuff about a private cryptocurrency also makes no sense. So you can see very quickly um, how you can just disaggregate all those opinions and realize they make no sense from a technologically, uh, technological pers technology perspective. Second one, uh, what, can, what can cryptocurrencies help solve? Um, they can be used as a form of international uh, payment, a store of value. They can be used to create smart contracts, as we mentioned, uh, with, with decentralized applications, gambling, insurance, loans, etc. cetera, um, even real estate, um, digital museums, tons of other stuff that we haven't even thought of, um, thought of yet. Um, an, another one that you can think about is, um, sorry, is, is, uh, is, uh, is, is it global computing? So right now, um, if I have a high-end computer that I'm working on, I would in theory be able to loan that out to you if you're in Africa and you're working on some new movie, I could actually loan the computing power to you because we'd all be connected in this world room that's just more decentralized in, in nature. Um, and then what needs to change? Lots of stuff needs to change, okay? This is like a very new technology still. Um, it needs to be faster. It needs to be more efficient um, in terms of electrical consumption. We need to have more types of privacy um, options for people. We need to have uh, more adoption. We need to have more people creating new applications, so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of different things that need to change. Uh, we need the digital, uh, sorry, digital bank currency, sorry, digital, sorry, di central bank digital currency uh, would be a way to bring in more uh, money into the system to make it more viable. Again, there's a lot of stuff um, that needs to change. And so that's pretty much where I'm gonna wrap up on here. Um, again, uh, hopefully I gave a pretty good overview in layman's terms of what's going on and how this stuff works. And again, I would just like to say, I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm very used to being called crazy. It's happened to me um, when AMD was at 30 bucks, when NVIDIA was at $40 and I'm completely used to this stuff. So it doesn't bother me. But I just like to say that if you, if you really um, are paying attention to this presentation, just ask and, you, and you're a naysayer, just ask what it means to you if you're wrong. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong. All I want to say is that if you are wrong, what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for your future, what you should do um, with your decision making? So I'll stop there and kind of open up to the Q&A section. Um, I'm putting it on the, um, putting the Q&A section as a uh, cryptocurrency overview, or sorry, crypto asset overview. So you can get an idea of if you want to get involved in the space, um, where you can go. Um, so you've got, on the top left, you've got, um, the various ways required in the bottom left, you got accessing it, venture funds, coin fund is an example. I'm using them only as an example because they've got all the different types. They've got um, uh, generalized mining, which they have. They have a venture fund. They also have a crypto hedge fund they've started. So that's pretty much all three types of <coughs> ways to invest in the sector. Block tower, polychain, token fund are other examples of, of crypto funds. Um, you've got uh, exchanges. Um, you've got peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, uh, transaction with local Bitcoins, et cetera. So again, this is just a slide to explain how you can get access to it if you're interested in it. So I guess I'll wrap up there. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mitch, for this very interesting presentation and uh, the fruitful discussion. Uh, thanks also um, to all the participants um, and um, have a nice evening. And uh, well, I wish you the nice remaining day and best wishes to the US. Thanks a lot, Mitch, again. Yep, thank you very much.